Cool. So, hey everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today and uh, welcome to the Patrick Global Health Innovators talk series. Um, and quickly, I would like to bring your attention towards the uh, website that's like, please join us at patrick.org and join our workspace at tiny.cc slash patrick slack uh, to collaborate on the digital pandemic response. And further, if you're interested in looking at the previous talks in this series, please visit uh, tiny.cc slash PCF research talks. And uh, I'm joined here by my organizers, Christine Glorioso, uh, Nina Resek, uh, Tautitev Sethi, and Ramesh Raskar. So uh, thanks everyone for putting this talk together. And uh, thanks for all the speakers for agreeing to talk today. So, right. Uh, for the for the first talk, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Aditya Prakash and Alexander Rodriguez. So Professor Aditya is an associate professor at the uh, Georgia Tech Georgia Tech, and he did his PhD from CMU and his bachelor's from IIT Bombay. His, uh, his team has won multiple awards uh, at the CMU uh, Data Science Challenge as well. Uh, he was nominated as the fac uh, Facebook faculty in 2015. And Alex is his PhD student who's been leading the deep COVID efforts, uh, which, was, which has secured the top place in the Catalyst Facebook COVID-19 symptom data challenge and the second place in the C3 AI COVID grant challenge. Uh, so we're excited to see uh, what both Alex and uh, Aditya have here for us. Uh, th thanks a lot for taking your time to join us. Uh, so I'll stop my screen share and uh, you guys can take over. Great. Thanks a lot, Rohan, for the nice introduction. So let me start by sharing my screen. So is it visible? Can you see it? Just want to make sure. Yes. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, sorry. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So great. So yes. Uh, so thanks again, Rohan, for uh, uh, having us uh, uh, and all the organizers for this nice series. Uh, so today, so I'm Aditya, and as Rohan mentioned, uh, uh, to the, together with my PhD student Alex, we wanted to give you a sense of what we have been up to for the past year or so uh, uh, as part of our COVID response. Uh, so uh, we come from a very AI, ML, data science kind of perspective. So the talk will have that kind of a flavor uh, as we go along. So uh, a bit quickly about our lab, right? So our background, as I said, is data science, AI, machine learning. Methodologically, we focus a lot on graphs, networks, and time series and sequential uh, temporal data. So, uh, I, I mean, we love data. That's, that's the first requirement I say for any student joining the lab. Uh, and the emphasis is really on solving big data problems in network and sequences. And we, we are frequently motivated from high impact applications such as public health, is it one of our major application areas, urban computing, uh, engineering, security, and the web. So uh, uh, a little more on our past work can be found on my website. So uh, in this context, one of our lab's focus, as I said, is to explore the performance and utility of data-driven methods in public health and epidemiology. So this, this spans the whole uh, uh, pipeline from surveillance, interventions, vaccination, uh, modeling, right? And and, uh, and and from all of these problems, we want to see how data can help and how we can help bridge uh, the gap from models to uh, decisions and actions uh, using data. So uh, our, our, our thesis is that data from multiple sources is uh, often more sensitive to what is happening on the ground. It's more reliable. It's, it's, it's more uh, 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 re uh, real time, right? And it gives you a complementary helpful perspective to other traditional models. So that's where we are coming from. And, and one example of this is AI models for forecasting, which Alex will also talk about uh, in more detail later. So we all know that there is increasing data collection. Why data science and machine learning, right? I mean, we all know there is increasing data collection. In part of our work as well, we have used a variety of data sets uh, ranging from mobility, point of care, line lists, surveys, social medias, and so on. So, so, so we all know that uh, these data collection is increasing day by day. And I think the COVID pandemic has accelerated many of these trends uh, to also help you get very granular data at different uh, time and spatial as well as temporal scales. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I, I think uh, data science and AI have a big role to play in public health in the coming years, because in, in addition to this increasing data collection, uh, I mean, we all know questions for epidemic spread naturally have a large spatial temporal scale which, which, which uh, uh, I think motivates using automated methods, right? To, to, to do something very quickly and in real time. And there are multiple such scales. And this is precisely where uh, data science and machine learning can, can help. Uh, networks are everywhere. That means these uh, 
the relational uh, that these data points are not independent they are correlated which need to be taken into account uh, models are becoming more and more complex uh, i mean ranging from both covid hospital acquired infections and all these uh, different kinds of diseases in uh, in these uh, uh, new settings and and uh, at the same time uh, this data collection also brings up many challenges about small and big data they are noisy incomplete so frequently maybe they even uh, are, are conflicting right so what you're getting from one signal might be in conflict with other signals so th that's why you need some principal methods to to, to make sure that uh, what you're predicting and what you're trying to assert is, is statistically significant and at the same time, uh, in the past few years, new data science and AI techniques, uh, for example, deep learning, which I'm sure everybody knows, uh, can handle end-to-end -end learning and are more responsive to dynamic changes, right? So you don't uh, need to go through laborious feature engineering to make uh, things work. Uh, uh, so, so I think there, so there are, uh, at the same time, no stochastic optimization techniques, which can help uh, models to scale well to large data sets, city scale, nation scale uh, uh, models. And that's precisely why uh, I think uh, this is a great time to do data science and AI for public health because now new computing tools can work in conjunction with the domain experts, epidemiologists, biologists, uh, engineers, and decision makers to 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 close that gap. So that's precisely so. Uh, th this is really the motivation for our, our labs' work in this space and why why we are uh, and from which viewpoint we are coming in. So as part of this, we have been involved in a lot of. Uh, uh, uh things and actually as as i think many of us right when COVID started we felt uh, uh the, how, how we can help right and how we can bring our expertise and experience into uh, in, into this area and do something which is meaningful right uh, because i think last year at this time things were not looking that great uh so our COVID response has spanned a lot of different uh perspective. So uh, apart from forecasting, we have been involved in visualization to communicate. So communication is also a major thing. They've been working with uh, folks from Berkeley and Illinois. Then uh, we have been, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about our on-campus uh, 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 response, which is based on like uh, Wi-Fi mobility and data-driven intervention. So this is a joint work with folks at Georgia Tech and, uh, and, and recently one of our collaborators moved to Northeastern. And then uh, 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 the adaptive surveillance, where we are trying to use genomic data as well as uh, uh, other kinds of uh, uh, EHRs and so on to, to, to do some sort of ad adaptive surveillance with the University of Virginia. And uh, we are also working with uh, folks at Iowa, uh, UVA, Johns Hopkins on, on hospital acquired infections and how COVID and HAIs like MRSA and CDF can interact and how, how they can make things harder and or easier, right? As, uh, and and how, what kind of precautions do we need to keep in place at hospitals to uh, do? So, so uh, really, we have been involved in many different things. I won't get time in, uh, to go over each of them, uh, but I hope to really talk about maybe at least two of them to give you a sense of what we have been up to. So the first example is uh, real-time forecasting, right? And uh, the problem is very simply stated. Suppose you have these incidence death counts on mortality on, let's say, COVID, and you're given this time series still... Uh, say here right uh, this is 36 or 38 and then you want to predict the future or, or what is going to happen so maybe it goes down stays still goes up and obviously anybody who has done epidemiological modeling knows that this depends a lot on how interventions are in place current number of infections uh, contact patterns exposure to the disease weather right so many different complex variables which can play a role into how this can uh, uh, go, uh, go go forward in future. So hence, uh, we focus on something called short-term forecasting, which is like we are not doing projections uh, as opposed to like the traditional mechanistic models. We are we are more interested in what's going to happen in the next four to six weeks. And, and that's where we want to bring in uh, machine learning models and data-driven models into picture. So why forecasting? Uh, forecasting allows an outlook to the future, uh, 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 right? And, and, and it allows communities to allocate resources and budgets. For example, you can plan uh, in the short term, right? Like you need, uh, if, if I give you a four week uh, ahead uh, prediction of what's going to happen, you can allocate resources and budgets based on that. So ventilators, how do you direct and So logistics and play, uh, logistics and supply uh, chain management heavily depends on these kinds of forecasts. Uh, it can al also inform public policy, right? Like should we mandate shelter in place? Uh, uh, it improves preparedness. And, and one thing which we didn't really appreciate in the past year and we have a better appreciation for is that it also helps in public communication which is a very important factor of uh, pandemic management because you need to communicate to the lay people uh, as they plan their own risk models and what they can do and what they shouldn't do, right? So, so forecasting is useful for all of these different uh, dimensions. And our participation in the CDC, forecast, so Centers for Disease Control Forecasting Efforts have been ongoing for the past few years, not just for COVID. So it's been led by Bijaya, uh, who just, uh, Dr. Adhikari, who just uh, uh, joined the University of Iowa as an assistant professor, and Alex, who, who, who you'll be seeing uh, 
uh, soon. So, uh, so we have been involved, for example, in CDC's ILI, which is like influenza-like illness count prediction. So, which uh, where a dozen teams from universities and national labs have been participating for the past few years. So, we have been participating there and doing pretty well. And then, uh, as COVID came into picture, then we were one of the first teams uh, to start uh, also pivoting to doing COVID-related mortality and hospitalization uh, forecasting. So, and and this has re received a fair bit of. Uh, visibility, uh, I think, for the past year. Uh, I mean, it's been uh, consistently features on 538, referred to the CDC director, and so on. So so, it, it, so I, I guess what I want to convey is that we have been working in this space in looking into uh, different uh, forecasting models and how, how they uh, uh, work, especially on short-term predictions. So that's that's something which we have been very interested in. So uh, this all, uh, one of the first models what we developed for flu was based on, so this was a couple of years back, was a deep one of the first deep learning based approaches for influenza forecasting, where we we wanted to develop an end to end model, which can uh, learn directly from the historical seasons and try to predict how the burden of influenza will uh, proceed in in the current season. Right. So so uh, it turns out that it it can forecast multiple targets without really doing very detailed feature engineering. At the same time, it performs pretty well. And the, in fact, in our first season, we had the best performance in the HHS one region uh, in 2018. I think. So uh, I think it pretty it it worked pretty well. I think maybe more than what we had expected, as uh, many of the other models are very highly fine tuned, and 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 uh, it requires a lot of uh, human involvement as well. So so given this uh, technical uh, infrastructure which we had, it naturally occurred to us that can we use this for uh, COVID forecasting as well. So but but if you so so I want to start first with uh, like just influenza itself, right? And especially if you consider February and March last year really there was no covid uh, surveillance system in place which which or testing in place which could tell you actually how many people are infected and, and there's no reliable indicator of uh, covid uh, cases so and uh, I, I think a lot of people uh, focused on influenza as a surrogate indicator right of what's maybe happening to uh, in in place of covid because of symptomatic similarities so the wli curve for 2019 you can see the black curve here right it looks very anomalous compared to the other gray curves which are the previous seasons so we we start we got motivated from this perspective and uh, i think uh, one of the first things we did was okay how do we steer our historical model right and and this might be due to symptomatic similarity between covid and influenza right cough fever and also uh, uh, like healthcare seeking behaviors of people were changing. So it's a very complicated signal, right? Which cannot be just modeled using simple uh, mechanistic models. So uh, the historical models are basically unable to capture the unexpected trends. In fact, you can see here that all the historical models used to predict a general decrease as compared to the, the what really happened. And our model, which we which motivated uh, motivated from this problem, is able to capture the right trend. So we developed, uh, we, so we studied this problem of steering a historical model. So I think this was a nice novel problem from a, a machine learning perspective as well, which is how do you principally steer a historical model trained on historical data to, to exploit new signals as well, right? So the new signals, which I talked about, like mobility surveys and so on. So we use this technique called transfer learning, but only you, you need to do it only when needed. So the, the system needs to learn that automatically. And there are other tricks, which again, Alex will talk about later. And again, it performs pretty well. And as you said, I think this is a clear indication that uh, why, why you need to do this steering, right? Otherwise the uh, historical models will not predict uh, the right ones. So using this idea, then I think when when we so COVID started uh, spreading and we had a better indicator of COVID uh, signals, then we, we we started doing COVID mortality and hospitalization forecasting as well. So uh, we developed this framework, Deep COVID, and we have been doing weekly submissions since April 2020, up to six week ahead predictions. We built this module uh, where, where uh, we could, again, it's a deep learning model, end to end model, which can uh, predict up to six week ahead of both hospital and hospitalization for uh, mortality indicators. Uh, our impact in forecasting has been, uh, uh, I think, pretty good. Uh, uh, as uh, Rohan mentioned, we, we got the first and second prizes in a couple of uh, uh, competitive challenges uh, where we participated then, uh, and a recent uh, evaluation led by the CDC. For almost a year, we have been the only individual deep learning model in top five. Uh, with top five inaccuracy, right? And and also in media, we have uh, received a fair bit of coverage, uh, uh, as I had mentioned before. So it, it, in all, I think we have gained a lot of valuable experience in in uh, doing real time predictions, and and I think uh, uh, this has thrown open a lot of interesting technical challenges as well from a data science and machine learning perspective as well, which we are slowly beginning to even uh, explore. Uh, the second example I quickly wanted to talk about was supporting camp campus response. As I mentioned, uh, we have been working with folks here at Tech and uh, uh, Northeastern on uh, 
understanding how do you use uh, how, how do you help campus administrators uh, to tailor their response to their campus right and i think this was a big uh, discussion last year at around this time in summer uh, uh, sorry, yeah uh, uh, last year in this time in summer. so i'm seeing some questions in the chat so maybe i can answer them later uh, uh, after the talk is over uh, so uh, at, at the time the prevalent idea was use enrollment data which is course registration data of people and, and understand just move to remote classes, right? So this was done by Cornell, you, you see very nice papers, which was published last year around at this time. So that was the dominant uh, thinking, but but uh, we also started thinking about the risk that uh, there was another uh, uh, trade-off, right? There was a risk of an outbreak as well as a financial crisis and the universities were facing dire financial straits and also educational outcomes would suffer if we had if we indiscriminately move things to online. So hence, uh, uh, and, and because of this trade-off, right, uh, we decided, okay, how do you do this in a more targeted fashion? And that was really our motivation, that is there a way to do this in a more targeted fashion? And for that, we quickly realized that we need some sort of a mobility data, right? Because we want to capture how people move on campus, because only then that we can get a more fine-grained picture than, let's say, using uh, static enrollment data or uh, registration data. So we collaborated with uh, uh, Gregory uh, about who just left, as I said, he's now the dean at Northeastern. Uh, and they will, and they are from a ubiquitous computing uh, space, and they were thinking in terms of uh, uh, like using Wi-Fi. Uh, they were collecting Wi-Fi data at Georgia Tech to really help people with educational outcomes, right? Like mental health and so on. So we, uh, when I talked to him, we quickly realized that maybe we can repurpose that kind of a data to to do something in terms of epidemiological spread as well. So so this is how a Wi-Fi log looks like, right? And and uh, we can quickly figure out if you. So if you are on campus, your mobile phone or your laptop logs onto the Georgia Tech. Wi-Fi network, enterprise network, and it and and we log it right. So GT is logging this data anyway before even we came onto the scene. So this is time, right? The user ID and the log. So so basically, you can use Wi-Fi as a course location sensor and to understand if two people have been in close contact, right? So that's really what we wanted to con uh, capture. And at that time, I think there was also a realization that COVID does spread in close surface, uh, close. Uh, 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 classrooms and closed uh, rooms, right? Uh, and there was a thing. So, so this this is a very natural way of capturing that kind of uh, closeness as well, uh, right? And GT has around seven thousand access points across two fifty buildings. So the coverage is very high, and there are a lot of people. And we had data even from a non COVID uh, uh, semester, like twenty nineteen. So that gave us a very nice control to understand what has happened in in a COVID semester of tw fall twenty twenty. So uh, the big picture which we wanted to understand was how useful is this sensor stream to analyze social interactions which are uh, important for uh, COVID spread. So uh, again, I won't go into too much detail, but the basic idea is that uh, uh, if you look at from remote classes, right, which is what usually administrators would uh, were defaulting to, and, and something called localized closures, which we, we try to uh, ca uh, characterize using this Wi-Fi mobility data over a period of a semester, it can you can see that uh, localized closures are much smaller, right? So it's and it's more targeted, right? Instead of just closing indiscriminately all remote classes and moving things online, we are focusing more on exactly uh, uh, like uh, uh, important locations where people maybe congregate and which may not be administrative or educational uh, locations. So that that uh, helps keep things more uh, uh, in, in person rather than just going everything online. Yeah, so this was work with Vedant and Jaja. Uh, so I, I should tell Jaja to have a better picture. I think I couldn't. Uh, so we developed a COVID model, uh, right? Uh, and and uh, one of the things I do want to mention is that Jaja Tech had a great surveillance system. I think that was a big, uh, uh, reason why and a great, great Wi-Fi system as well, which used to collect data at scale, which was enabled this work, right? Because without that, we could not calibrate and we couldn't do anything meaningful. There are many interesting calibration questions because the data is noisy, and network design and optimization questions because this is like a time varying network. So, which which we need to solve to to enable this. But the main takeaways from this paper, right? Uh, is, so, so the preprint is out uh, uh, and it's under submission. Is that Wi-Fi mobility can really help design effective network-based policies rather than just static enrollment uh, data only approaches. You can improve outcomes and reduce burdens. Uh, there are obviously privacy questions, but the real question is: is it worth it? And the privacy considerations might be a little weaker because this is in in the context of a closed system like a university where people already have to sign up agreements before they, they join. So, so there are very interesting discussions to be had in this space, I think, and, and we hope that our paper uh, sparks those things. So what's next? Uh, many technical questions, uh, which, as I said, which, which we want to solve, more complementary directions, which we are exploring uh, through many of our different partners. We are open to collaborations. We have been working closely with my hospitals, campus, and other uh, 
and we want to extend our techniques to other situations, right? Uh, using more behavioral data as well, uh, like vaccine adoption, distribution, and uh, bridging with mechanistic models as well. That's another uh, direction we have been uh, trying to explore. Uh, recently, in fact, we organized uh, on behalf of the NSF, the National Prevent Symposium, which was to uh, 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 like catalyze the science of a pandemic prediction and uh, prevention. And, and one of the unique things here was, was we really this, this idea of that, like you can bring computing and data science and thing with, other right like it and can target questions at scales and also in conjunction with other domains right so it was a great uh, two days in february where we had this uh, workshop with a lot of leading scientists and researchers who came and gave their vision as well about what how uh, these uh, different uh, uh, areas can interact and talk about uh, and, and try to address this basic challenge the videos and talks are actually coming soon on our website so those will be stay tuned for that finally thanks before i turn on to alex for a quick uh, deep dive into uh, forecasting but yeah, I'm, and we are hiring postdocs, PhD. So if you if you if you're interested, shoot me an email. Thanks. So Alex, I guess. Uh, uh, I think it's working right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Vidya. I'm going to go quickly over uh, what our work in real time forecasting. Let me see if yeah, the controls are working. Okay. Sorry, the controls are a bit, uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, we have, we're going to go briefly about, uh, about this work that we have here. We have a combination of uh, recent, recent, recent research innovations. Also, we have some data science contests as I did introduce. And finally, we're going to go through some uh, preprints that we're going to release in archive soon. And our focus in forecasting, we can see several aspects in the in forecasting. And also challenges related to this. The aspect, one aspect is disease spread. Uh, here, we want to model, for example, a special structure, the human mobility, interventions, policy compliance. Uh, from, um, we can use data, leverage data for, in order to capture some of this disease spread. However, these data also have some issues, some quality issues, delays, anomalies, and revisions. And other aspect important is utilization, the decision makers, how they are going to use it, what they want to do. They want actionable forecasts, they want interpretable, inter uh, they want to have appropriate and certain codification. So having this in mind, we're going to go over these works. The first one is uh, the COVID contaminated influenza, forecasting COVID contaminated influenza. As Aditya introduced, uh, the eye-like influenza, eye-like uh, illness, counts are going to be um, shifted in the distribution is going to be shifted due to the COVID introduction. This is a novel scenario, therefore historical data is inadequate for uh, representing this, uh, for forecasting in this scenario. What we are looking also is at COVID-related signals, which are more correlated with this new behavior. So what we are proposing is to steer an existing historical influenza model, a PD, which uh, Aditya also introduced you know, it was it is from our lab with these COVID-related signals, which are limited in size. What, uh, specifically, what we propose is our framework CaliNet, which is based in heterogeneous domain transfer learning. Uh, we are basically here from a, uh, from a domain of influenza only to a domain where we are having COVID and influenza coexisting, and also we have con COVID signals. We want to uh, tr uh, transfer some knowledge from the blue box to the green box. Here in the green box, we also have a spatial temporal model in which we leverage regional uh, similarities, regional correl correlations between regions that are adjacent to each other. Uh, specifically here in our framework, we have also some attentive knowledge distillation losses, which the tension weight basically is going to allow, pro uh, uh, allow positive transfer of knowledge when it's appropriate and prevent when it is not. I'm going to the results. We have here an example for the US national. You can see that our error uh, is the lowest in comparison with the state of the art models. And you can see here uh, our depiction of predictions we are adapting better to this novel scenario. Now going to our real-time forecasting framework, the COVID, you can see that we have three modules. These, are, uh, these three modules are, con are talking to each other, the data, prediction, spinability module. The spinability module has a graphical user interface so that the people, so that a, a human in the loop can uh, understand and also improve the forecast. 
going deep, a bit deeper into the technical part, then the data, we have a flexible uh, data extraction pipeline. We have to do a sort of cleaning things and imputation. In the prediction part, we have to employ a neural network with a small number of parameters because we want to avoid overfitting. We want to do also robust uh, optimization because the data is small and self-reversing forecasting because we want the, the, for the, the predictions to be the consecutive predictions to be consistent, to be related to each other. And in the last part, explainability, we use data ablation for the current week in order to understand our predictions and also to improve it in the past weeks. In retrospective, we can use it also to improve, uh, improve what we, we could have done and we could do in the future, right? Um, some highlights of our results. Here we are comparing against the COVID HAP ensemble, which is the ensemble of all the models submitted to the CDC. And here we can see that in, in our error is lower than, than the COVID HAP ensemble for the US national. And in the probabilistic error, we, which is measuring our confidence intervals, we are seeing that it is very close to the COVID HAP ensemble. Also, another observation that we have is that we are able to anticipate trend changes. As you can see, we are able to anticipate trend changes with three weeks of anticipation. And also other observations that we have, in this case for hospitalizations, because it is daily predictions, we can see that we can uh, capture find the grain patterns that are reporting grain patterns uh, that are more granular in time. Now moving to our uh, this data science contest organized by Facebook and C3AI, the goals of this contest were to create data-driven methods for situational uh, for improved situational awareness. They wanted to see if their data could help for it, for example, for sensitivity, timeliness, and we found that our work that we had. Uh, was fitting very well in this in in in, in this in goals that they had in the, the data science contest, uh, but on top of it, we wanted to also extend it. We had to extend it in also that we can systematically explore multiple data sources and types so that we can understand the contribution of this data into different facets of forecasting. And we got also feedback from public health experts so that we can make this work more impactful. And here are some examples of our results for the symptom Facebook symptom data. In short, we what we do with uh, what we found is that surface signals help improve performance, especially for short-term forecasting, and they also help in anticipating uh, future trends. Now, uh, uh, to wrap up, I want to introduce uh, two more words. The one is backfill, which is about revisions. So let me explain what is revisions very shortly here with this plot, with this uh, uh, image. We uh, at the beginning of the data, for example, maybe released for CDC, the, there is going to be some reporting error. And as revision weeks pass, as weeks pass, this re reporting error is going to decrease, it's going to reach to zero. So we are going to get to an stable value. So we, here we have several states, so we can see the different, uh, each state or each region have a different dynamics. So we found that there is this, this is a significant problem in several regions, in also several features, even a target, and this is affecting models in, 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 the, in their performance. Therefore, what we propose is a met, the, our method back to future. What we are saying is, given any forecasting model, either mechanistic or statistical, we can improve its real-time predictions. So you can think of, of this, this, this approach as a wrapper for any model. And this is a novel architecture based on recurrent graph neural networks. We are uh, using feature similarity, revision history, and model bias. And our code and, and archive preprint is going to be very soon. I encourage you to use it because it can improve any, any model that you may have. And finally, our, uh, our working uncertainty quantification with a non-parametric approach. Our, our method is called APFMP. We are using, we are marrying Gaussian processes with deep learning, with sequential model, which is a novel direction. And we found that this is, this is leading us, leading to better calibrated and more accurate a forecast you can see here in the during the peak we have higher uncertainty because we, which is actually desirable because during the peak is we don't know if it is going to go is going to still go up or down so this is very uncertain re, uh, period of time and here in the right we can see that it is a uh, this uh, calibration plot if we are closer to the diagonal we are better and we can see that our method is, is the, the closest one so a code and archive preprint also coming soon for this I want to just thank, uh, end thanking our collaborators and our research support and also the invitation that we received.
And yeah, look forward to any questions maybe now or later. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Aditya and Alex, for that uh, insightful talk. And I can already see there are a lot of questions on the chat, and I'm sure there are a few more coming. So uh, we can take the questions during the QA session, which is towards the end of the talk. Uh, and yeah, once again, thanks a lot for this talk. And let's let's move on to the next talk. So, uh, Tau, uh, I'll hand it over to you. Sure, thanks, Rohan. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nishant Chadha. So, so Dr. Nishant Chadha is the head of Research at India Development Foundation. It's a private nonprofit research organization based out of Gurgaon. Uh, Dr. Chadda is also a visiting associate professor of economics at the Ashoka University. And as economist, his main interest is in education, economics, and uh, economics of technology. His research has been published in leading national and international journals. And he has also been contributing to uh, Business Standard Economic Times and Times of India. He has a Bachelor of in Technology degree from IIT Kanpur and MA and PhD in Economics from the University of British Columbia. Uh, in COVID, Dr. Chadha has been contributing to uh, mobility and its effect on uh, COVID and its effect on uh, mobility and the relationship between these, and also more recently on the, the gaps in vaccine coverage. So over to you, Nishant. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Tav. Um, <clears throat> And um, thanks very much for having me here. Um, so my um, work is, I think, going to be a little bit different than what you just saw in the first presentation, perhaps. I think you're frozen, Professor. We can't hear you. Uh, uh, what you, uh, uh, you? Yeah, we are losing you, Nishma. Um, Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry. I think there's a there's an issue with my internet connection, but uh, this should be better. This is good okay. now. Can you start over though? I'm sorry, we we lost the whole. Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Um, so yeah. Uh, thanks again. Thanks once again. And uh, what I was saying is that uh, as an economist, my interest is understanding why uh, people do. Um, things that they do. So that will be the flavor of my talk. And uh, what, uh, as Tav said, what we have been uh, working on and what I'm going to primarily talk about today is the use of, um, is whether uh, mobility data can be used uh, for pandemic response in a very different uh, way than uh, perhaps we just saw. So just very quickly, uh, let me summarize what uh, I'm going to say later in some detail. But what we do is we investigate the impact of increased risk of infection on aggregate mobility, right? So what I want to understand is how increased infection affects mobility. Uh, we'll find that increased risk decreases uh, aggregate mobility and you will very soon see that mobility actually responds to the spread of the virus before the spread is picked up in aggregate case numbers. So my interest is not actually in, uh, uh, not really in predicting uh, 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 cases or uh, 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 to be honest, but just to understand whether behavior that people display uh, before uh, uh, you see something in the data can be useful about understanding uh, what is going to happen, right? So, uh, so that is uh, where I'm coming from. So uh, very quickly, the idea is the following, right? So typically um, when we think about uh, mobility and uh, um, disease spread uh, in this uh, uh, framework of epidemiological models, the idea is that, uh, you know, in agent-based agent -based models, of course, uh, mobility uh, to some extent almost always automatically translates to disease spread. 
and therefore uh, restricting mobility becomes uh, uh, useful to uh, prevent disease spread. Um, and most of these models uh, take um, mobility as given, right? But uh, uh, as I said, so uh, to me that sounds very uh, that sounded very odd, right? Um, and that's why I started doing this stuff because I actually don't do public health uh, uh, a lot. But to me, that sounded very odd. And uh, therefore, what I'm going to say is think of a very conceptual frame, uh, a very basic conceptual framework of how I am going to think about mobility and disease spread. So the idea is that, um, you know, like all economic decisions, uh, the decision to move in has some benefits and has some costs. And that is how we always uh, think people make decisions. Uh, that is how we always model them. And so it is quite possible, it's actually possible to take a very uh, simple uh, utility framework with uh, benefits and costs to mobility and come up with something that looks like a very simple mobility function, right? So this function uh, of uh, mobility for individual I moving from origin O to destination D is, let's say, a function of um, characteristics of the origin of the destination of the individual themselves some measure of distance between uh, the origin and the destination doesn't have to be uh, geographic distance only. Um, and our subscript I, which is the risk of infection as perceived by the individual I. And uh, the very basic idea is that how should people respond to an increased risk of infection? And uh, what I'm going to uh, assume is that uh, rational people respond by reducing the probability of movement. Okay, so if you perceive that uh, uh, you know right now the risk of infection for you is high, you uh, reduce the probability of movement if you can. And so if you can't uh, reduce your uh, movement, it must be because for whatever reason, going out to you outweighs the costs of probably getting infected. And uh, so, so that is the basic idea, right? So the idea is that uh, uh, mobility is, and it first is endogenous to this model, meaning that people respond to increased risk of infection. They, just, they don't keep uh, the mobility at the level it was, they, it, it will change. And it will change in a very specific way, which is I will fall as the risk of infection increases. Right? So what we'll do is, uh, again, I'm gonna use aggregated data for this presentation, and I'm gonna make a very simple case for it. So I'm going to use uh, 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 Facebook's uh, mobility data, aggregated mobility data, which uses location information and aggregates uh, from users who have these permissions switched on and aggregates them to, uh, um, to various levels. I'm going to use uh, data from districts in India, which is the administrative uh, bound, uh, uh, setup. Um, and uh, you know, we'll aggregate this to daily movement data. And again, very simply, I'm going to look at three measures of uh, mobility. Two of them relate to inter-district mobility, so mobility between districts. And the reason for focusing on districts is that um, the last sort of uh, mile of uh, COVID response in India are uh, district administrations, right? So any mobility restrictions that are imposed, that are removed, any uh, uh, first level COVID response, that is the responsibility of district administrations, right? So that is the administ administrative boundary, therefore, that we will focus on. And uh, I'm going to define uh, uh, with simple percentage changes from baseline mobility, right? So in, and uh, I'll take two measures, inflows and outflows. So inflows are all movements into this district, uh, whatever district we're considering, uh, as a percentage change from the inflows during the baseline period. Uh, I'll define the same thing for outflows. And then I'll define uh, uh, within district mobility as movements within the administrative boundaries of the district. Okay, so I'm going to aggregate this data. And uh, uh, I'm going to try and walk you through uh, the idea by using a very simple, by using uh, graphs and uh, one district to make the case. And towards the end, I'll present some statistical results. But um, so I'm going to, and the district I'm going to use is uh, uh, Pune, which is uh, a district in uh, Maharashtra, which if you know of the COVID situation in India, uh, has uh, throughout the period been uh, one of the most uh, affected uh, uh, states in the country. And Pune is one of the most affected districts in that state. So this is uh, the uh, uh, analysis for 
this year, starting uh, uh, Jan, 1st Jan 21. And uh, to, to set the context, this is the COVID spread in the district. And you can very clearly make out the second wave of, uh, and the magnitude of the second wave in, uh, uh, in India generally uh, following this, but this is one of the first districts it started in. And uh, so, you know, the curve sort of started uh, accelerating sometime in the middle of February. Uh, and uh, the green line that you see at the very end, that's the uh, announcement of uh, by the state government of, a, of what in, we call it in India a lockdown, which is essentially absolute mobility restrictions, right? So pretty much all kinds of mobility uh, are, uh, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, prohibited. Uh, our work from last year suggests that that doesn't really work. Uh, restrictions without COVID spread uh, don't seem to change people's mobility. Uh, they still keep moving around. So, um, but but that, that's the context, right? So, and as you can actually even easily see the acceleration uh, uh, in the COVID cases for a huge part of about two and a half months. The data that I, we have goes towards almost to the end of April. Uh, this obviously has eased uh, uh, in the month of May and uh, uh, June now. Okay. Um, Okay, so what is uh, what I do next is let's take um, the mobility data, right, and uh, plot it with the uh, COVID cases, uh, data on COVID cases. So the yellow curve, the this curve is the same as uh, last time, uh, the last graph. It's just active. It, it's been renormalized, so I have divided this by thousand, they so that I can bring the scale of the two curves to the same and uh, put them on the same graph. Uh, for comparison. So the first striking thing is that uh, these curves are almost exactly mirror images of each other. Okay. Um, and this is something that we have found, as I said, throughout our, our work with this, that um, COVID uh, uh, increase in COVID cases. Uh, uh, here I'm measuring them through active cases. I can measure them through a normalized risk of infection as well, is almost always negatively correlated with mobility. So mobility uh, that, you know, response to um, COVID spread. So people respond to the, the increase in uh, uh, the COVID spread by decreasing their mobility. So the vertical lines that I have on this graph are some of these, uh, some um, sort of uh, important dates. So statistically, mobility reverses its trend. It was almost constant at a very low level, right? So compared to the baseline, it was still around 35% lower than the baseline, but that was because COVID cases were always present. So it had not, the mobility had not has not returned uh, uh, to its uh, pre-COVID levels uh, because of perhaps a lack of economic activity, fear of the virus, uh, could be multiple things, and uh, it was pretty flat. And somewhere around the fifteenth or sixteenth of February, which is the red line, it started uh, declining. It, there's a secular downward trend throughout the period. Um, how is the government responding? So the green line. Uh, which is this one, which is 19th of February, the chief minister of Maharashtra had a press conference and uh, said that uh, COVID cases were increasing in three districts. Pune was not one of those districts that he mentioned. Uh, they were in a region of the state called Vidarbha, and he cautioned people to maintain, uh, uh, take you know, COVID appropriate behavior, else they would have to intervene with restrictions. But no restrictions were put in place this month or the next month. And then on the 4th of April, uh, there was a night curfew. So restrictions during nighttime. And then during the day, there was an um, uh, 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 order against congregation of more than five people in public. So those were the orders, but those were issued in 4th April, on 4th of April. And then the 13th of April, uh, on the 14th of April, which is the orange line towards the end, that's when actual mobility restrictions were introduced. So as you can see, um, even without any restrictions that were imposed by the government or uh, people themselves rest started restricting their mobility. In fact, the funny thing is that around the 14th of February, there was a notification by the government which was talking about opening up of the state in the fact, given the fact that there had been no case for a very long time. Or not no cases, but very few cases for a very long time, right? So it was completely, completely misread the situation. Um, so now, uh, you know, maybe it's possible that it is not uh, uh, COVID cases in this district in Pune that are responsible, but maybe it is the fact that uh, other districts that are uh, Pune is connected to, those see a rise in cases and hence people reduce their mobility. So what we do in this graph is uh, I, re I remove uh, mobility to and from the three districts that were uh, uh, mentioned as the 
uh, uh, hotspots uh, by the chief minister. N nothing really changes on the graph. Uh, public transport, by the way, was working throughout uh, uh, this period. So it's not as if people aren't being able to move. Uh, in fact, public transport was, uh, when the lockdown was announced on the 14th of April, uh, public transport was considered an essential service. So it was not disrupted. It was, orders were only issued restricting public transport on the 21st of April. And by that time, mobility was already about 55 percentage points lower than the uh, baseline. Um, local government response, uh, there was. So the way local governments respond in, in district administrations respond in India are by declaring something called uh, local containment zones. So you restrict mobility locally and uh, try and allow uh, 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 economic activity outside those uh, containment zones. And this time, this year, in fact, throughout the country, uh, there has, unlike last time, there has been an attempt to def define something called uh, micro containment zones. These are essentially how individual uh, uh, residences, uh, apartment buildings, right? So these are really, really small areas. But even then, you will see that in the month of February, there were like two uh, containment zones, essentially two buildings that the uh, Pune uh, District Administration uh, uh, counted as um, uh, uh, containment zones. And you can see it here, right? Why? Because they actually the acceleration had started happening, but you know, you're not seeing any cases. It's an exponential curve. So you wait for a week and then you see the explosion. So nothing is happening. So there are no containment zones which actually use uh, tested you know, COVID cases data to define uh, their boundaries. So it's not the containment zones. It's not what anything the government is doing. It, it, it definitely does seem that people are restricting their mobility uh, uh, by themselves, right? And we find something very similar in the within district uh, mobility data. And um, so just to, uh, and we have done this uh, quite systematically now across uh, at least the state of Maharashtra and we are expanding it. But it does seem to me that uh, there is a very clear causal relationship between uh, an increase in the risk of infection and uh, 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 reduction in mobility, uh, which may or may not have consequences for epidemiological models, but you know, it definitely has consequences for how government should respond to uh, um, uh, uh, spread of virus. Uh, and uh, kind of similar to what Aditya was talking about in terms of, uh, you know, avoiding either or solutions, right? So uh, either close down the campus or, uh, uh, you know, have uh, 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 risks uh, spreading infection. So um, very quickly, as I said, um, I, so we use, uh, so these are, uh, uh, appear to be causal relationships. Uh, we, the interesting thing is, that lagged mobility is also negatively correlated with COVID cases. There are a number of reasons why that might be the case, because uh, especially uh, when you have a huge caseload um, and uh, testing capacities are limited. Uh, what has happened this time, for example, in India is that uh, essentially it's an economic activity, it's an economic service, right? People want to get tested, they're willing to pay a price for it, but you cap the price. Uh, so you essentially have to ration. Uh, testing, right? That's what happened in India. You were rationing testing, which meant that a lot of cases went uh, undetected. And in a lot of cases, there was a huge time lag between the uh, uh, symptoms appearing, people getting tested and actually getting the results. So there may be reasons why uh, uh, test and COVID case data, at least in, in, in Indian setting, are delayed. And um, so that's the uh, uh, that's this uh, my work with uh, uh, mobility um, data and the fact that mobility uh, um, is uh, uh, an individual response to uh, this virus uh, spread. As uh, Tav mentioned, uh, I'm also doing something on vaccination and again, approaching it from a very economic perspective. Um, so the vaccination uh, uh, um, debate in India is quite different uh, uh, than the one in the US. Um, the, if you, uh, uh, for those of you who are aware, uh, um, there is a lot of this question about uh, the availability of vaccines, right? So this idea that the government doesn't have vaccines available and uh, uh, therefore supply is an issue. What uh, we are trying to say is that like everything else, like what you see in the data in terms of vaccine coverage is an equilibrium outcome. It's not simply supply driven. There are demand considerations as well, because anything you do is going, anything in the world is, uh, whether it's a market or non-market activity, uh, uh, has some price attached to it. 
Now, vaccines uh, uh, may not have an actual price attached to them uh, uh, or vaccine delivery, but there are problems that people in India have uh, uh, in terms of access. Uh, a lot of most Indians, uh, major, a majority of Indians don't actually have very easy access to healthcare, which means they also don't have access to vaccines. Uh, and uh, they don't, a lot of them uh, don't understand uh, what vaccines do. That is my guess based on some of the work that we have done. I know direct questions, but I'm looking at areas where you uh, education, literacy, everything seems to predict uh, uh, or seems to predict whether you will have low or high vaccine coverage. And so the last point I wanted to make was that there's a lot of this thing about uh, using digital tools to overcome something, called, something you know, people call vaccine hesitancy. To me, vaccine hesitancy is the idea that you understand what the vaccine does, but you overestimate the risk of taking the vaccine and therefore, for whatever reason, are unwilling to take it, even though you understand what it does. And therefore, to me, uh, 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 vaccine hesitancy in the Indian context should be very different. Most people don't understand what a vaccine is, what it does. And so therefore, uh, thinking of the same uh, 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 context as you would in a developed country is wrong. And secondly, as I said, there are a lot of things that appear to be demand side factors, things like people not going to the hospital to take the vaccine even when it's, when it's there. But the fact is that the hospital might be too far from your place. If you have to miss a couple of days of work to get vaccinated, you may not want to do that. And uh, lastly, as I said, you may, not want to, you may not completely understand what the vaccine does for you. So um, that's the work that we're doing on the vaccination side. But um, the, the the summary is that I'm trying to approach these problems as an economist and just trying to understand how people are behaving in this whole uh, setup and uh, um, trying to give them the benefit of the doubt, right? Uh, people are rational. They should know what is good for them. That's uh, uh, what I've learned for the last 20 years. I do believe in it. So um, anyway, so I'm, that that's 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 uh, uh, very briefly what uh, uh, I, I've been doing on the pandemic. Wonderful. Thank you, Nishan. Um, we'll take questions Thanks, after sir. the next. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that might be better. Um, so, uh, Nina, I think you can. Yes, so I'm very excited to present our next speaker, uh, Dr. Vito Janko from the Jozef Stepan Institute in Slovenia. So Dr. Vito uh, obtained his uh, bachelor and master's degree in 2012 and 2015 respectively in the inter interdisciplinary program shared between faculty of computer and information science and the faculty of mathematics and physics uh, at the University of Ljubljana. In 2020, he received his PhD at the Jozef Stefan Institute in Ljubljana, Slovenia. His main research interests include collecting and interpreting variable sensor data, context recognition, and especially energy efficient implementation of the data. Uh, he was a member of the team of the SHL competition winning team in 2018 and 2019 a member of Cooking Challenge competition team who also achieved first place in the 2020. And he was also a member of the uh, GSI versus COVID team that won the second prize at the uh, recent X-Prize pandemic response competition. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, let me share the screen. I hope you're all seeing it. So in the previous meeting, Nina already presented our work on the X-Prize Pandemic Response Challenge. So today I'm presenting a different one about how we studied uh, the effect of non-countermeasure factors on the spread of COVID-19. So, you know, by now we know that COVID affected the whole world, but not all countries were affected equally. And it's also known that one of the main factors for this is the strength of countermeasures, things like school closure, quarantine, wearing masks, and so on. And there may be other factors, for example, weather, population density, median age, they're not connected to countermeasures, but could be equally important. And this is kind of the goal of this study, to isolate such potential factors. Because if we do, we could understand the disease better and how to fight it. So specifically in this study, we collected the information about 100 of these factors for each country. We, for each country also determined how hard was it hit by COVID-19. And then we tried to use machine learning and statistics to kind of find the correlation between the two. 
And well, the first problem you kind of face in this kind of research is that the effect of countermeasures tend to overshadow everything else. So in this study, we actually took the time um, time frame in the beginning of the last year when the COVID pandemic started, but the countermeasures were not yet applied. So this gave us something like two months of data in for different countries. And even in this time frame, the countries were affected very differently. And well, we wanted to know why. There was another research question, and that is we reviewed a lot of literature on the topic, and the results were very conflicting. Let's say some paper would say whether well, it affects it, some it doesn't, or it affects it in a different direction. And we kind of wanted to see if we can spot some methodological weaknesses of papers and how to improve them. So our methodology starts by picking this time period. And for each country, we started collecting data when adequate testing was present. This was adequate was defined by World Health Organization um, recommendations. And then we started when strict countermeasures took place. And this period was kind of a different for each country. And then if you take, take a look at the infections, uh, these are some randomly chosen, um, what you get curves like this. And the first thing one can see is that they kind of behave differently in this period, which is colored. So for example, a typical curve would be before testing, there's all the obviously zero infections. Then there's a bit of exponential shape. And then after countermeasures, the curve flattens out. Mm, and we tried to, and yeah, so we saw even visually that's kind of important to pick the time frame correctly. And you also in the paper show numerically that if you don't, you get completely different results. Mm, so we had to take these infection curves and put them into numbers. And we chose three different metrics. One is the reproduction rate, which is a standard metric that is used. So if I get infected, how many other people am I going to infect on average? Uh, the average infections per day normalized with the population, which is also a commonly used statistic, but also the shape of this curve. So if the disease goes uninhibited, it kind of takes an exponential shape like those in red here. And if it doesn't, maybe there's some factor that's kind of pressing it down. And well, you, then you can take one of the statistics and you can order all the countries from best to worst. So the red one would be those that were hit the hardest by the infections, at least in the beginning period, and the green one were those that weren't. And we kind of split countries into two categories. And our goal was, given factors, can we determine in if it's like in the upper part or in the bottom part. This is a very like a rough prediction, but given how unreliable data was in this beginning period, this was about the best we could hope to do. And you can get a map like this. So according to this average infections per day uh, metric, the red countries were those that hit the hardest, the green those that weren't, and gray were those that either we didn't have enough data or that there wasn't enough testings that we would think uh, data reliable. And one thing one can see is that if you use a different metric, you actually get slightly different maps. Some countries match, but for example, if you take a look at India or Brazil, they are green in this kind of map and red in the other ones. It actually does matter how you kind of define your infection class. And this is probably because they kind of tell a different story. So the average infections per day tell you how bad the situation is right now. While the reproductive rate would, for example, tell you more, is it getting better or worse? So on the other hand, we need to define some factors. And we defined more than 100 of them, collecting them for each of those countries. Some of these factors were related to weather, so temperature, humidity, air quality. Some were connected to mobility, like a previous talk already talked about. So how much people moved, how much tourism there was, plane passengers, and so on. Some were connected with, for example, what were the prevalent diseases before uh, coronavirus, so things like respiratory diseases, or what the kind of vaccination did people take in that country. Mm, some were based on a study that did questionnaires in each country and then find out that in some countries, people tend to be more individualistic or they tend to obey authority more than in the others, you know, in average or there's also statistic how far apart people stand in different cultures. And we also took these factors into account. Then we have a bunch of factors that talk about development in the countries. 
And while this doesn't affect the disease directly, your standard of living, your access to healthcare could be a factor. And lastly, we have factors about uh, geography. So the area of the country, population density, in which part of the world is it, and so on. So now we have both. So we define how this infection classes, we define the factors. And one of the things we did is that we would use both standard and custom machine learning techniques to find the correlation between the two. So given factors, we wanted to predict is the infection gonna run, run rampant in that country in the beginning period or not? And we managed to do this with an accuracy of roughly 80%, depending on the infection class and so on, which is much better than the baseline accuracy of just guessing at random, which means that some of the factors I listed had to have the influence in the spread of the coronavirus. So I'm not gonna go into detail on this part, but maybe the more interesting one was which of these factors were significant. And what we did is we would do correlation between each factor in each infection class. And we would take a look if the correlation is statistically significant or not. And so this is something I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides. And before I go to the results, I would just like to talk a bit, um, how easy is it kind of to go wrong and make wrong conclusions using these tests? So this is one experiment where we um, used all the data. So all the countries that are currently regardless of how much they tested. And it turned out that 60 of the 130 factors were considered significantly relevant with uh, this kind of significance here at the bottom. And this is kind of a wrong, like this also means that you could almost pick any factor at random and write in a paper this is significant. And one thing we to do to improve upon that is that we acknowledge that if you throw hundreds of features into the mach this machine learning or statistical procedures, some are gonna be correlated by accident. So when we used a statistical test that used this to take this into account, the numbers fell drastically. But even so, th this was the data when the, all the, some of the data was unreliable. And when we correctly fixed that and cleaned the data, actually the number of correlation again fell drastically. And the last problem we had, and is that no matter how you do this uh, data collection, you'll get rules like this. So high GDP means high infection rate. It doesn't kind of make sense. Like why would having more money infect you? But then you kind of think that countries with high GDP maybe have bigger cities, denser population, more tourism, population is more free to travel and so on. And this causes high infection rates. And it turns out that just with machine learning and statistics, you can't actually find this causal relationship, only the correlations. So we modified our methodology a bit so that our rules would be more like, uh, there are some factor co correlated factors in the square and one or more of them is causing high infection rate. But you, a machine learning algorithm can determine which one. And then it's kind of a, for a human expert or more controlled trials to validate uh, the influence of them. So this is kind of acknowledging the, the weaknesses and how to work around them. So this is the results uh, where we kind of averaged factors across different metrics and different uh, way of doing the statistical tests. And we have this GDP, which I already talked about, and there's some co correlated uh, factors on the right. I'll, okay, on the right. Uh, additional factor that was kind of interesting was individualism, like uh, countries with that showed more individualistic tendencies actually did quite worse, um, which I guess makes a certain sense because even the beginning phase, there were some recommendations about mask usage, but people could wear them if they wanted or not. You know, they had to decide if they want to wear them. Um, there's also openness, which is a bit harder to explain why it cropped out, but it did come as a relevant one. A very relevant one was um, tuberculosis immunization, which is something we also find in related work. So countries where people are vaccinated against tuberculosis, um, those countries were hit less by the coronavirus. And I think uh, the countries with high blood uh, zero type would hit more, which is also something we found in the related work. So yeah, so this is kind of a, what our methodology found. And again, we don't really claim that all these factors spread coronavirus as, 
because this methodology is really good at isolating potential factors. But for confirming it, it kind of needs a complementary methodology that can do things in a more controlled way. Because whenever you do the statistical tests on a large scale across a lot of countries, a lot of things happen by coincidence alone. Mm, somewhat curiously, like weather was nowhere on the list. This could be because it doesn't uh, influence, but it could be because we only collect the data from uh, spring of the last year. And maybe if we found a way to, to kind of process data from the summer where uh, temperature went up, but uh, infections went down worldwide, we'll get different trends. But this is something again that we found interesting. So yeah, uh, in this study, just to recap, we studied this effect of non-countermeasure factors. We isolated some potential factors. We found way how to um, kind of go wrong. And we also um, found some of these things in related work where they kind of found uh, re relevant factors on a bit shaky methodology. And at the end, we just like to recommend that we, if you're using this type of research, um, you can't rely on machine learning alone. So this paper is right now in the review process, but you can kind of already read it as a preprint on this link. That's kind of my time. Thank you for listening. Awesome. Oh, that's that's great. Uh, thanks, Vito, for that talk. And I can see like a lot of questions there. So I think we can move on to the Q and A session. Um, okay. So yeah, I think the there's a question right now. It's for Vito. Probably we can go from bottom to top. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, so Professor Shahid Jameel is asking, uh, there is a correlation between low air quality and high spread. And is there any biological explanations? Uh, we don't know for sure, but the, the most uh, let's say relevant hypothesis is that a lot of low developed countries actually had uh, low infection rates, probably because they don't you know, have as much tourism and so on. And also this kind of countries had a lot of air pollution. So in this case, it, the, the, the relation is not direct. It's one of those indirect relations like GDP, where we don't believe that actually low, good air quality causes uh, infections, but the same countries that have low air quality also have low infections by you know, other causation means. I see. Um, so, Okay, I think there's a question from Christian where she's asking about uh, what do you think about some version of causal analysis to get a correlation versus causation differentiation? Yeah, well, I mean, we tried to do it, but we couldn't really find um, a good methodology that was reliably finding this causal relationship in the data. And a lot of it, so we kind of resorted to the fact that we'll see some red herrings and then but by kind of a listing all the correlated factors, we might identify one, oh, this one is actually causing it. And so we kind of bring the expert in the loop instead of relying only on the machine learning. But yeah, if you know some really great methodology to do this, uh, I'm all ears. I don't, that's why I was asking you. <laughs> yeah, so. it's a really difficult problem. And I think it's partly insolvable if like the system doesn't have any knowledge of how real world works or some uh, if it is just kind of a goes from a typical machine learning data. I had a related question, Vito. So have you looked at uh, structure learning approaches for, for causality? I mean, so I'm, 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 it's, not the, it's not the best way, but um, definitely better than uh, just correlation-based models. Um, so we found something very similar, as you said, red herrings and uh, directed relationships using structure learning. So just wondering if you have tried some of that as well. Um, I haven't heard quite at the beginning what you recommended, but if you have a method that you tried, can you please link it and I'll take a look and sure. maybe we could use something like that. And this kind of collaboration is why we're all here. We're, we have a literature review group, so we, we might add that to the list of topics, uh, trying to review the causal, the ways that people have been getting mm -hmm. at causation during the pandemic. Yeah, I mean, like, I, I would be gladly to let them know some, some ways that we didn't find for this. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so I think there are a few more questions on the chat, but uh, meanwhile, if someone else has any direct questions, so uh, feel free to mute and ask. Uh, I can get the other questions in the meantime. Um, maybe Dr. Um, Prakash can just sort of like summarize all of his answers at once or some of them because there were a bunch of questions for him. Right. Uh, I think Alex can uh, help us with those questions. So, so yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure, sure. Right. Rohan, please. Okay, cool. So uh, I think one question was uh, how would like you had mentioned using retrospective learning. Uh, so using the newer corrected cases that CDC or any other organization is providing to improve the model. So a question was along, uh, how would you make sure that there is not uh, a, an intense shift in the model? So let's say some sort of event, some super spreader event happened in, at a particular time. So we don't want the model prediction to be completely swayed based on that learning. So uh, how was that sort of tackled in the work? Um, yeah, so what we what we are doing is also the, I mean there are several anomalies in the data that we found uh, as as you said maybe there are some of these events that uh, may happen and even we found that even there is a very different epidemic curves before and I mean, at the real time at real time and after the revision is very largely related very different the, the, you can see the epidemic curve is very different and all the models are predicting something very different from what actually happened. So this is a very misleading. Uh, so what we are doing is using the history of what happened in the past with these revisions in order to use it here. And we found also that even, even to these anomaly, anomalous events that you just mentioned, we also are robust to this. Uh, we can improve even in this. In this. this is a very challenging. I, I think that this is something that is very challenging and maybe not fully addressed. But still, our model is able to uh, overcome this, this normal use. Got it. So I think the other question was, uh, have you looked at other countries' data? Because uh, And how do you deal with the ground truth? As JHU could be inaccurate due to testing or data, misreporting, et cetera. And how does the model uh, deal when testing capacities are changing over time? Yeah, I think that... Uh, I think there, the first question related to the, the country's data, we uh, we haven't explored yet, but definitely is something that we would like to explore. Uh, I think it will be is kind of it's about collecting the right data and then using it and seeing how it will it, it will perform. Right, but we have been doing this mostly for uh, states and also uh, regions delimited by CDC in several uh, so or around all the around the US. Uh, related to the to the revision, the, yeah, to, there are some revisions, there are some e- e- errors. We have been using two tools. That's why that's what I wanted. I was talking at the end of my talk about the revisions, backfill revisions, how to model them, uh, how to model these corrections, and the other part is understanding the uncertainty. There is uncertainty in the data on reporting. There's many sources of uncertainty, so we have to understand uh, incorporate that into our predictions in a, in a meaningful way. In, in, so we have a, a whole framework that is working around that topic. So that is, those are very related to these two works that we have been exploring the thing. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so the other question was on the uh, flu outbreak prediction that you had mentioned. So mm-hmm. for flu short-term prediction, can it be split by region since it's spreading through different countries at different rates? And does this improve the predictions? Yeah, so if we are doing it by regions, yeah, uh, so a region contains several states, it is demarked by the CDC. Um, but in top of, on top of that, we are not only considering the isolated regions, but also considering that the regions are next to each other. So regions, right, because the virus spreads especially, so it's likely that one region that is next to each other, the other another, is going to uh, have similar epidemic trajectories. So we are also exploiting that uh, with some constraints or some also uh, some regularizers in our machine learning model. I see. And uh, have you looked at any form of clustering different regions in based on some parameters, uh, or has is that an interesting thing to look at? Yeah, the clustering of different. So, for example, in our backfill problem, in, 
we are use we are we are in the mammography program, we are seeing that there are some patterns in revisions that are across several regions. So several regions have similar patterns. So we are we are actually presenting and in our study we're presenting that these patterns can be clustered via re, in regions and also via each features can be um, sorry each each uh, in so if you can think of uh, five patterns and in each of each of the patterns you can find several regions and several also features and so on. so we found that this kind of similarities there also in a previous work we also found we we actually our model is deep learning model is explicitly uh, designed to exploit similarities across regions and across also uh, epidemic trajectories. So basically, the dynamic similarity across as we move in the season, we exploit dynamic similarity between what we are seeing and what in the past happened in other regions and in other uh, other times and other, in other seasons. So yeah, definitely we have explored that uh, that topic. I think it's important because. We can overcome data scarcity or data sparsity there. Like, like that. Got it. Uh, so I think the other question uh, that came up is based on the CDC collaboration that you have. So, uh, given the recent pop in US cases and more openings across state, are you working with CDC future projections for upcoming fall? And what would happen if US opens fully with no mask mandates? <laughs> yeah. And, um, yeah, that is something that yeah, we actually we are working closely with CDC. People is still uh, we are um, there is a there is a new group inside CDC that we are thinking also participating maybe in the future when because we are going to bridge statistical models and mechanistic models. So the mechanistic models can give us answers to the questions of what will happen, right? what if questions. Uh, so we are working on on, on, on we are exploring that. Uh, yeah, and the CDC is also interested in understanding these kind of things, right? What will happen if maybe vaccination stagnates, right? Or what will happen if what, what you suggested right now? So uh, our model is right now limited on that, but we are just working in closing this in that, right? Right, awesome. Uh, okay, another question I think uh, is, have you tried uh, transfer across different data modalities of COVID? So example, cases predicted from social media signals versus administrative data versus uh, some sort of ablation study. Yeah, we have done ablation study understanding which are the most impactful signals uh, for prediction, for per first for performance and also for, uh, for understanding which signals can give us some uh, early indicators of what is going to happen, for example, if the epidemic, sometimes we are seeing that the epidemic is stagnating and then suddenly it's going to go an uptrend. So there are some signals that are more, more helpful in, cer in so certain parts of the epidemic. So for example, at the beginning, we found that mobility was most important for performance, but later actually uh, data like testing was way more important because mobility was probably people was taking more care of themselves. So, uh, it was not as impactful as, as at the beginning of the pandemic, for example. So yes, we did some, some studies like that. We have it also in our paper. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Okay, so I guess the next question is uh, for Professor Nishal Sata. So uh, one thing that I've concerned about since the beginning of the pandemic is that lockdowns are imposed at the peak of the cases. What if lockdowns happen when cases started to rise instead? I think the recent lockdowns don't work in part is because the cases would have gone down anyway at that point. Also lags between reported cases and when people are infected. So this is a question from uh, Christian. Um, I agree. I think if you're going to do a lockdown, you should do it early. Whether you should do one or not is a different question. And I think um, as an economist, I, of course, uh, it, it's problematic given India's structure, uh, uh, the economic structure, it's very difficult to have lockdowns because you are actually, for some people at least, you are trading off uh, uh, almost a certain destruction of livelihood with, uh, with, a, with, a, with a small chance of, a, uh, of getting, in, you know, of a fatal uh, 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 incident. So... Um, so, so I agree. I think that in part you should, uh, as I was showing, if you were going to lock down, you should lock down early. Um, and then the second thing is, I think that um, 
Yes, uh, I, I think uh, COVID uh, uh, data in India, especially during the second wave, my guess is is uh, is extremely patchy. Now, uh, the way I, I mean, in some cases, when you use the data, I, I think if the measurement errors, for example, across uh, districts or states were the same, it wouldn't matter to some extent, right? Unless you were actually trying to understand how much uh, infections you have. But as long as the uh, uh, ratios are similar, uh, mismeasurement measurement errors are similar, perhaps you could use the data. I don't think they are. I think some states are much better at uh, uh, recording the data, collecting it and reporting it well. Some states not so much. And as I was saying, I think uh, 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 the other thing in India, especially during the second wave has been this um, the lack of testing because uh, there's a huge gap, right? There's a huge gap between uh, 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 when you uh, show the symptoms, when you request a test and when you get one done. And that is uh, uh, um, I have various reasons, but one simple reason is that, as I said, it, you know, you, you're the, uh, well, our public health system does test, but not so much. Uh, uh, most of the testing is done by private healthcare providers who charge a price but they're not allowed to charge whatever they want. It's capped. So the moment you cap it, you uh, obviously, the, you know, uh, uh, you have to cater to everybody, but then in which case you get tested later. So there are issues. And um, therefore, I think that you need, you know, that's one of the reasons we started doing this is because to understand whether there was something that could be, could be done at a very broad level to understand, uh, uh, get some uh, warning symbols, uh, warning signals, not actually predict anything because that's again something that I what I do and also to me it seems that uh, the amount of information India has is is probably not going to uh, 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 work with any decent prediction model but that's anyway um, yeah we've been thinking a lot about that so we're we're getting around that problem with Facebook survey data and Twitter data and trying to get crowdsource the real case numbers for that exact reason. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but yeah, I wonder, I mean, I think a cool paper might be to look at when lockdown was imposed compared to the, uh, place on the upswing. So if earlier lockdown actually ends up in less cases, I know anecdotally looking at the U S data, San Francisco <laughs> did much better than New York and they locked down 10 days earlier. So I would imagine that, that, that would be true, but. I think we did, um, uh, in, 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 we have done this, uh, um, and I, what I presented, we've done this uh, for the whole period for India. So our, uh, uh, starting on 21st March last year, and um, we did lockdown last year way before we had any cases, right? So in, in most of uh, the, the country, we don't have any cases. Uh, and we locked down, we have no counterfactual, so I don't know if we hadn't locked down what would have happened. Uh, but if we believe epidemiological models that did, uh, we did reduce the uh, spread. What we did observe, though, which is very, which is very uh, uh, surprising, but not if you believe what uh, uh, our results today, which is that even during the lockdown, what we saw was that mobility only decreased in areas where there were there was uh, a, a risk of infection. In areas where there was no risk of infection, uh, especially rural areas, uh, small cities and small towns, we actually didn't see anything uh, in terms of reduced mobility. Um, actually, going back to your question, I think one of the problems India has is, uh, is this, right? That we are relying a lot on uh, digital tools to do everything. But India has a tremendous digital divide. It, has, it is huge. So you can actually split the country horizontally, right? So you'll have one segment which will be uh, very well covered by all your digital interventions and the other one which will be completely left out. And they will be left out in your testing data also because they don't have access to anything, including uh, uh, healthcare or testing. So they won't show up in the numbers at all. They may show up in mortality numbers, but uh, I, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think our mortality numbers are very good right now either, right? So uh, there's a lot going on there as well. So, yeah, I mean, I think that some of these tools are quite useful. Um, uh, absolutely can be because um, we, we are using uh, something from Facebook too. 
Uh, but I just we have to be careful. I think in a country like India, you have to be careful with how much you rely on uh, some of these interventions, which can actually be quite self-defeating. Because uh, for, for a very strange reason, for example, our response to, uh, uh, um, and I'm sorry, but our response to, for example, vaccine hesitancy can't be informational campaigns for digital tools. Because it is the very people who are hesitant, your our tools will miss out. So for a, for a public health setting like India, we need uh, uh, offline interventions. You need analog interventions, otherwise they're not going to work. And uh, um, that's something that is specific to uh, an emerging country context. I, I think it will be true in India. I think it will be true uh, in some other countries as well. So it's a challenge, but uh, that, that, I think that's what, uh, that's what the situation is right now. I think this is, this is interesting because where my brain goes thinking about this is like, what if what if we could just get accurate, more accurate information to people about their risk and then maybe they would just self right. solve the problem uh, themselves, knowing whether it was a high risk time or not, or they were high risk or not. Like if you could just get that information to people reliably. Because I they think so too. I, I, I do want to rely on, uh, I, I can... <laughs> I mean, I, I completely agree with you. I think I, uh, uh, it's, it's perhaps uh, um, to some extent best left to, if you don't want to lock down, right? I, I think that this is, uh, that, see, locking down or not in a country like India is actually, um, it's a very difficult problem because if you do it, you get in trouble. If you don't do it, you get in trouble. And therefore, politicians just want to play this, you know, you want to be safe. And so I think if you're not going to go for some uh, uh, drastic solutions, then the best thing to do is perhaps make, uh, uh, allow people to, um, make the best choices that they can. Um, and that is important. I think that is also very important when it comes to vaccinations because uh, this uh, something else that we have seen uh, recently, it's very strange, is that there are about half the districts in the country where, uh, uh, for example, gender coverage is higher than the demographic proportion in vaccination, right? And then you have uh, uh, the other half of the country where it is worse than... Uh, uh, the demographic uh, proportion, right, uh, for women. Now, um, now I, I don't know why that is. Um, it could be a combination of factors, including the fact that most women in India don't work, most men do, and therefore, uh, you know, you, you have uh, problems with uh, taking time off from work and something like that could be at work. So, uh, yeah, in fact, one of the things we tried at the beginning, but it's very difficult to get that information is, um, you know, what level... Uh, of information actually plays a role in individual decision making, right? So if you know, for example, of COVID cases in your in your neighborhood, versus I tell you what is happening at the uh, uh, country level, do you change your behavior? Right? Would it, would it matter? And what level of information would matter? So I think that's an interesting. Uh, 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 it is certainly a, a, an interesting idea. Great, uh, awesome. So I think there's just one more question, uh, which is from Tau is. Again, to you, Professor Nishan, uh, does or can your approach include uh, temporal changes in the risk perception? You're on mute. So we've uh, we, we, uh, we've um, tried uh, something. Um, as I said, um, qualitatively, it doesn't because uh, uh, throughout uh, our analysis, what we have found over time is that uh, mobility and uh, COVID spread are negatively correlated. I think the intensity might differ, uh, which meaning the intensity of the response, right? And I, I think that might be different. But I don't think we have enough sensitivity in the data to pick that up. Um, we may still want, we can still try that. I think it should. I, I completely agree with the intent of the question. I think it should, and therefore we looked for it. We actually looked, we compared uh, 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 places in the first and the second wave. They kind of look very similar, right? In, as I said, qualitatively in terms of response. Um, so I think the first, in India's case, I think the first lockdown to people who could understand, uh, sort of drilled in the idea of what COVID was, because there was a lot of informational campaigns in the first few months. So, so uh, and I think those are primarily the people that are probably being captured by uh, the Facebook data in India. So maybe that is at play. I'm not so sure, but uh, we, we did try that. Uh, we don't 
seem to be able to find something in the data. Great, thank you. Thanks. I just, I just want to say I'm super inspired by all of these talks and I hope everyone joins the Slack because there's so many avenues for collaboration. My brain's just like, ooh, we could do so many things. So um, I would just love that. So, so the way to sort of start collaborations is just to like join the Slack, join the rate channels, and then we've got meetings and we can, um, you know, start the ball rolling. This is awesome. Definitely. So uh, thanks, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, and special thanks to all the speakers, uh, Aditya, Alex, Vito, and Nishant. Uh, and we look forward to working with all of you again. Uh, and yeah, as Christian mentioned, please join our Slack channel. It's tiny.cc slash pathcheck Slack. Uh, so look forward to working with all of you again. And I'll yes. stop the recording right now and, and